station come tell me. Oh, here we go. We're on. We're on. Hi, now. everyone. Um, glad you all could join us today. Uh, it's, uh, this is sort of a, a road show uh, I've been doing with Dr. Al Torki. We've done this a few times. Hopefully, we'll try and bring some new stuff to the uh, agenda today. Uh, there is a lot of new things happening, and, and so that's the goal is to keep everyone up to date on the latest uh, in this exciting space of perioperative immunotherapy for uh, resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, my uh, co-chair today, Dr. Al Torki, is uh, the vice chairman of cardiothoracic surgery and chief thoracic surgery at Whale Cornell Medicine. He's the David B. Skinner professor of uh, thoracic surgery uh, and uh, perhaps one of the most accomplished thoracic surgeons around. And so I'm, I'm just lucky to, to be here. Perhaps, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you to all of you uh, who, who were uh, kind enough to join us today. Uh, thank you to Peerview for providing this educational session. Obvious thanks to our uh, sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Merck for the uh, grants to make this possible. Welcome to our uh, virtual attendance. Uh, there's some uh, virtual polling. There's some devices on your tables there for you to answer some of the questions that we've put up uh, during the session. Uh, and feel free to submit questions. If you have questions live, please come to the um, microphone so that uh, the online audience can, can hear the uh, discussion. Uh, feel free to visit this website if you'd like to connect with some of this content offline. We'll start with a few uh, demographic questions. If you could please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourselves. Uh, please select your MD certification, MD, MD, PhD, PhD, PharmD, RN, NP, PA, or other. All right, we've got a few of these. Let's see, it's like, hmm, having a hard time advancing. Okay, here we go. Please select uh, the category that best describes your role in practice. Are you a thoracic surgeon, oncologist, pathologist, pulmonologist, interventional radiologist, non-clinical industry or research, patient, caregiver, or advocate, or other? Uh, let us know how many patients you normally care for per month. 0, 1 to 20, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 80, 81 to 100, greater than 100. You must be very busy. Does not apply to you. All right. Almost done with this stuff. All right, finally, uh, which of the following practice settings is most applicable to you, academic, community, or other, or does not apply? All right, so now that uh, we got through that and most people have their food, we can get on with the, uh, the meat of the talk. So. I think it's no surprise to everyone here that um, the landscape for non-small cell lung cancer uh, as a whole is shifting extremely fast. You see this paper that was just published last year with all of the new drugs that have been FDA approved in the metastatic setting and a few very important uh, landmark uh, advances in terms of the perioperative uh, setting. Uh, and this is a woefully out of date uh, paper that was done by the leaders in the, in the uh, discipline just a year ago, now multiple new pieces of information coming forward with uh, perioperative immunotherapy. It's not just the systemic treatments that are evolving at rapid pace. We have pivotal data. This is uh, Dr. Al Torki himself presenting at the World Lung on the CalGB trial, uh, exploring sublobar resection. I'm of the strong opinion that we need to start integrating all these different pieces of data, although today we're talking mostly about locally advanced disease. So here's a patient uh, from my practice. Uh, can we treat pancos with perioperative therapy? We don't really have dedicated data for these patients 
that's of you know that's recent, certainly not with immunotherapy. 76-year-old patient with T4 and 0 squamous cell carcinoma, good PFTs, ECOG-1. She has some shoulder pain. Um, this lesion is going into the T2 vertebrae. You can see it encroaching there with some destruction of the vertebral body. Um, what do you guys think? Is this resectable disease? Yes, no, borderline, I'm not sure. These definitions are important because... Um, a lot of these trials aren't very clear about uh, what, what resectable disease is. Okay, so look at that. So some people, quarter would say not resectable, 10% not sure, which I think a reasonable response, and then Somewhere between yes and borderline is uh, the remaining two-thirds. So let's discuss uh, the data we have on this. I'm trying to move this forward. Okay, here we go. Oops. So I think we have, at this point, two uh, good randomized... Whoops. Oh, uh, do we have another? Here we go. Another polling question for you. Um, which of the, before we get started, just to see where you stand, which of the following do you believe to be accurate conclusions about neoadjuvant immunotherapy based on current evidence? First is neoadjuvant nivolumab plus chemotherapy resulted in significantly longer EFS and a higher percentage of patients with a PCR than chemotherapy alone. Addition of nivolumab to neoadjuvant chemotherapy did not increase the incidence of adverse events or impede the feasibility of surgery. Number three, Nadim two confirmed findings from Checkmate 816 in terms of OS and PCR predicting better survival. Four, combination of one, three, but not two. Five, one, two, and three. Six, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's see what you guys answered. Oh, do we get to find out? More music. How's it going over there? <laughs> All right. It doesn't look like we have answers. Maybe we can get on with it. Okay. So, yeah, the, as I was saying, the, the two uh, main trials that we have that, to derive some guidance around this are Checkmate 816, which was published about a year ago. Um, for the sake of simplicity, it's basically comparing patients of stage 1B to 3A uh, assigned to nivolumab plus uh, chemotherapy versus platinum doublet. We'll sort of skip over the nivo ipi stuff. Uh, primary outcomes are EFS and PCR. Nadim 2 is very similar, only that it's uh, exclusively for patients with 3A, 3B disease who are randomized to nivolumab plus uh, uh, carbopaclitaxel paclitaxel versus carbopaclitaxel alone. And those who got Nevo preoperatively got a six-month course of adjuvant nivolumab. Um, it's a smaller trial, academically run, but it's very important in terms of understanding the results of 816 uh, because of this. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to uh, the bottom right over here, where uh, the academic group was much better in terms of providing us with uh, clinical staging. So you can see that these are N2 patients, T3, N1 patients. There's a, about 10% where T4, N0 or T4, N1. These are classifications that we don't have from 816 in terms of clinical staging. Uh, and so this is useful to, to, uh, to add to our, our understanding. And uh, very importantly, a third of the N2 patients were multiple N2. A lot of people would consider that unresectable at baseline, but not the Spanish. Um, outcomes, PCR was comparable between the two trials. They both had vastly superior PCR in the, um, in the uh, chemo nivolumab arm. Slightly better in Nadim 2, not quite as good as Nadim 1, where it was about 63%. 
Is this because of the dosing of the carbapaclitaxel? Is it because that was a, an overcall based on the pathologist and with third-party review there was a more uh, rigorous review? We, we, don't, we don't know, but clearly comparable outcomes between the two. When we look at overall survival, which is what we care about in our patients, they also have comparable improvements. I don't think those lines are really well drawn. They're not favoring the uh, Nevo chemo as well as they should. These are redrawn. If you look at the paper, there's very clearly a 12% uh, difference between the chemo Nevo patients and the chemo patients at two years, a odds ratio of 0.57. Um, and in the Nadim 2, it was statistically positive with uh, has a ratio of 0.4, favoring Nevo chemo. 84% overall survival at two years is unheard of in stage three, really benchmark setting um, outcomes for these patients. PCR seems to confer much better outcomes for our patients, so achieving a PCR is a desirable uh, thing. And this was true in Checkmate 816. It was also true in the DEEM. You can see almost a flat line in the DEEM uh, in, in the patients who got chemo nivolumab here. Uh, really remarkable results. Remember, that was a third of the patients. When we compare the two trials, there's some really important things to pick out uh, between them. Obviously, 816 is a larger trial, 358 patients versus 90. Um, the endpoints are similar. The uh, stages are different, 3A, 3B in uh, Nadim 2, a much broader stage inclusion in 816. 816 is pure neoadjuvant, which is, whereas Nadim 2 is periadjuvant, and it's important to take note of that because we will get data on periadjuvant trials in the coming year or two, uh, and they will also, no doubt, change the landscape. Uh, progress to surgery, which has been a criticism of 816, 83% of patients not making it to the OR in, in Checkmate 816, 93% in Nadim 2. Uh, I think this speaks to the uh, maturity and experience of these high-volume treatment centers. The Spanish have been conducting neoadjuvant trials for the better part of 30 years now, going back to the late 80s and early 90s when they published their first one in New England. Um, and this is also true in terms of the R0 rate, which was higher in the Nadim 2 and more comparable to what we'd expect from our high quality surgical centers, 93% of stage 3A and 3B patients having a complete resection. I think that's remarkable. Overall survival, however, is comparable, although uh, 84 versus 82% where Checkmate 816 had quite a bit of uh, lower stage patients um, makes you think uh, that maybe perioperative will be a, a winning strategy. What was the cost of adding nivolumab to chemo for these patients? It was minimal. There was uh, no increment in adverse events of any cause or, uh, advance, or grade 3, 4 events. Surgery-related adverse events were not uh, increased either. 11.4 grade 3, 4 um, adverse events after surgery in patients who've received chemo nivolumab. If you look at the latest iteration of the GTSD for lobectomy, we're talking about grade 3, 4 event rates for 95% of patients upfront surgery, mostly stage 1 lung cancers in the 8 to 9% range. These are much more complicated patients having more extensive surgery with comparable adverse event rates. I think that's important to note. Quality of life is maintained with the receipt of preoperative chemoimmunotherapy. So don't worry about your patients coming to the OR uh, completely worn down by the treatment. Uh, oncologists are now able to deliver treatment in a very safe way. We now have to learn how to interpret pathology reports, which are going to change dramatically. Uh, your pathologist should be able to report things like percent RVT, which is the percent of residual volume of tumor. Uh, they should be definitely reporting major pathological response, which is less than 10% viable tumor. They should report whether there's been a PCR. It's a lot more work for pathologists, and hopefully new technology will facilitate their workflows. But it's important because EFS is dictated partly by the degree of response. So you can see here, um, Mariano Provencio presented this at ASCO last year, where you see uh, increments in EFS survival based on the degree of response. A lot of questions about what to do with patients who might have persistent N2. If you are one of those people who chooses to mediastinally restage your patients after induction, well, uh, this is nice data from Janice Taub saying that if you had a, P a PCR or 0% RVT in the primary tumor and the lymph node, you have your best response. These are the PCR patients. If you've had a PCR in the primary tumor and persistent disease in the lymph node, you have the same survival as if it's the reverse persistent disease in the primary and PCR in the lymph node. Um, the worst survival, obviously, is patients who have residual disease in both, uh, in both fields. 
So again, I ad advocate for patients to go on to surgery uh, regardless, because you get all this information, it's important prognostically, and as I said, the morbidity from surgery is not that bad. If you are okay with operating for stage one, you should be okay to operate for this. Um, extent of resection. These were data uh, presented by uh, Stephen Broderick at ITSOS uh, this, this fall. I think it's important and surprising to see that the, all those, albeit small cohort of patients who had a pneumonectomy had remarkably good survival. We have 76% EFS, so that suggests that their OS is even better uh, at two years. And, and so clearly through the 816 process, these patients were reasonably well selected, must have been physiologically fit. But I would not say that pneumonectomy is a, uh, is a contraindication to considering a patient for preoperative therapy. If you think they can tolerate it physiologically and you think it might be required, then I think it's an acceptable pathway. And um, I'll mention a few things about some of the trials that are ongoing or for which we'll be getting results that, should, uh, that you should be aware of regarding this specific issue. Minimally invasive uh, or thoracotomy. So one of the findings was in the stage three patients in 816, there were more patients who had a lobectomy, more patients who had a minimally invasive. Um, there's a difference if you just look at the blue curves, uh, forget the chemo because we're not giving preoperative chemo probably almost at all except for uh, specific circumstances. So we're comparing the blue curves. There seems to be less uh, good survival in patients who had a thoracotomy or conversion, but that's also probably because they had more complex disease or probably it's probably just an um, artifact of higher stage in those patients. What about R0? Uh, like I said, there was some criticism about the lack of uh, R0s in the uh, 816 cohort. It didn't seem to affect EFS that much. It's only a 10% decrease in EFS in those who, <coughs> few patients who did have an R1, R2. And no one here wants an R1, R2. I mean, that's obviously not what we're going for. But evidently, um, these patients still have a reasonable outcome. Um, and uh, although we're not <laughs> aiming to do incomplete resections, there are probably ways to salvage the patients who do have incomplete resections. So uh, just for the, to demonstrate learning, uh, if you guys don't mind answering this question again, um, which of the following do you believe to be accurate conclusions about neoadjuvant immunotherapy based on current evidence? I have to read these things, I apologize. Number one, neoadjuvant nivolumab plus chemotherapy result in significantly longer EFS and a higher percentage of patients with a PCR than chemotherapy alone. Number two, addition of nivolumab to neoadjuvant chemotherapy did not increase the incidence of adverse events or impede the feasibility of surgery. Number three, Nadim two confirmed findings from Checkmate 816 in terms of OS and PCR predicting better survival. And then four, five, and six being your sort of various combos. All right, we're not sure how you did on the uh, first set of questions, but it sounds like most, oh, here we got our pre-post. Ah, look at that, everyone's getting, more people are getting it right. I think five is the right answer, by the way. <laughs> Although you may have debates about that. All right, a little bit about what's on the, on the horizon. So I, I wanted to, to spend a couple moments talking about uh, the latest results of the LCMC3, which were published in Nature Medicine. This is a beautiful effort by a consortium of uh, US uh, thoracic oncology teams. Um, and it's a phase two trial, it's the largest trial of its kind looking at pure uh, IO, chemo-free neoadjuvant treatment. Patients got two doses of uh, neoadjuvant atezolizumab and then went on to surgery. Uh, there were pretty some strict guidelines about which patients, it was similar 1B to 3A, but the 3As, you know, were, were a little bit more restrained uh, than, than they were in 816. And then adjuvant therapy as dictated by usual care. So the, the pathological regression forest plots are not as dramatic as 816 or Nadim, but the survival curves are impressive. So does the benefit of immunotherapy sort of confer survival advantage despite the uh, perhaps more, uh, less extensive pathological response? It's, a, it's an excellent and provocative question, and we don't really have any trials, uh, large-scale trials anyways, comparing immunotherapy alone to uh, chemoimmunotherapy, but it's a compelling question because obviously no patients really get excited about the idea of getting chemo. 
Um, this is a really cool study that uh, Dr. Al Torki led. Um, I put this picture because it's really the perfect example of all the kids playing in the sandbox together nicely. There's some systemic therapy, patients got some Dervalumab. There's some radiation, but it's not too much radiation, low dose SBRT. And then the surgeons get to operate in a, in a nice, uh, cleaned up, safe field. Um, so just for uh, simplicity, I won't go through the design, but, but it's randomized, patients got two doses of Dervalumab alone versus two doses of Dervalumab where they got low dose eight gray over three days along with that first dose of, of Derva. You can see, it doesn't take a genius to see that there's a dramatic improvement in um, pathological response. Nearly 50% of the patients had a major pathological response with the addition of those uh, three doses of uh, SBRT-like uh, radiation. Um, this is chemo-free. It's really interesting, um, and the surgical outcomes were, were uh, exciting. So hopefully this will uh, be uh, something that we'll bring into phase three to be tested against uh, the new standards. Why did I put this? Well, uh, the next trial I'm going to discuss is throwing the kitchen sink at the disease. This the increased trial is presented at ESMO from a Dutch group. These were those borderline resectable patients, kind of like the case I showed you uh, at the very beginning. These patients got concurrent chemo radiation plus Nevo plus IPI, and then went on to surgery. It's a small trial of select patients. I'll draw your attention to the 81% grade 3-4 event rate, I think that's a lot. Um, but on the flip side, they had nearly 60 plus, well, 60 plus percent um, uh, major pathological response and over, well, 63 percent PCR. So great uh, response rates, um, uh, slightly concerning toxicity, surgical outcomes were good, uh, that said. Um, Compelling. Is this the way to go? Maybe for some select patients, but I do find it to be incrementally significant on the tox side. This is sort of a compilation of the, if you've put Checkmate 816 aside, a compilation of the periadjuvant trials, phase three trials that are ongoing. Uh, Keynote 671, which is interesting in that um, it's powered for OS in the primary endpoint, so it'll probably be one of the first to report on OS. One concern is that all the patients had to get cisplatin. They weren't allowed to get anything else. And the regimen for squames was gemcitabine, which is perhaps a suboptimal regimen that has less IO synergy. So we'll see what happens for those patients in the, in the squamous histologies. Empower uh, 030, which I don't really have anything specific to say other than I think it'll be extremely positive. AGN, uh, the only thing to mention about this one is that they excluded patients who might need a pneumonectomy. Um, and so these will probably be lower stage patients than 816, for example, and perhaps the other trials. And then um, 77T, which is really quite similar to 816 in terms of its design, only with that extra adjuvant portion of IO. So what happened to uh, my patient? This is her response post-induction. You can see that if you've ever treated oligometastatic disease, this is what happens to the bone when it's had a nice response. You get this rim of sclerosis, still a little bit of destruction there. Uh, it's a near complete metabolic response. So what do you do? Uh, you know, is this a PCR? This is a big operation. The patient needs spinal stabilization. They need a hemivertebrectomy. Well, we, we operated on her because that, that's... That's what we do. I learned how to do this operation from Garrett Walsh uh, down at MD Anderson. It went smoothly, um, although she had some problems with her rods and had to be re-explored to be re-stabilized. So it's, it's a very morbid operation. Uh, but she had a PCR. So could it have been de-escalated, maybe avoid the vertebrectomy? I don't know. Should we be operating on these patients? It's hard to know. Uh, I hope to, that we do because I think they can get good outcomes and be cured. So my take home message here is uh, in 2023, the most impactful tool at the thoracic surgeon's disposal is highly active preoperative precision therapy. So I encourage you all to get biomarker testing on your patients and to consider these treatments uh, as much as possible. Uh, and if any of you are interested in coming to Montreal, uh, June 16th, 17th, we have a great early stage meeting. Dr. Al Torki has uh, already told us he'll be there, and uh, I hope you'll come. It's F1 weekend, so I'm just uh, shamelessly plugging that. Dr. Al Torki, all yours. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I am here to tell you that all what you heard about new adjuvant therapy is a lot of hype, and that really the way to go is adjuvant immunotherapy. <laughs> so, that was a joke. <laughs> I, can, I can take it. Uh, okay, so this is the polling question. Adjuvant immunotherapy is currently FDA approved and indicated for which of the following patient populations with non-small cell lung cancer following resection and platinum-based chemotherapy. Patients with stage two to three A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on more than 1%, 1% or more of the tumor cells. Patients with stage one B to three A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on more than 1% of the tumors, one or more percent of the tumor cells. And patients with stage one B to three A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on 50% or more of the tumor cells, and four, I am not sure. All right, so 30%, 23%, so I think, you know, there is a reasonable division of opinion on this. So let's uh, go through the data. Okay. Uh, okay. So ever since I've been doing thoracic surgery, there's been this ongoing debate, never resolved, of do you give adjuvant therapy or new adjuvant therapy, whether it's chemo or chemo radiation or what have you. And there are some very strong arguments, I would say, for doing adjuvant therapy. Number one, there is no surgical delay. We all know that patients, by the time they hit your office, for surgery, they've already been running around for an average, I would say, of 60 days. So there is a lot of delay before they see you, and there is good evidence that delay is associated with poor outcome. Surgery following new adjuvant ICI can be more difficult. Now, the data here are very, very subjective, and one surgeon's difficult operation is another's easy operation. But those of you who have operated after chemo radiation and sometimes after chemotherapy know that these are challenging cases and there is no reason to assume that new adjuvant immun immunotherapy would be less complex. There is a few data emerging about that. There's a proven benefit for adjuvant therapy. I mean, think of it, in the last 30 years, the only thing that really worked, not so much, but worked a little bit, was adjuvant chemotherapy. And of course, immunotherapy is thought to be more effective in the setting of minimal tumor burden. So if you get rid of all the cancer, maybe your immunotherapy will work better. That is also a subjective opinion, not supported by any data. So there are four uh, randomized trials, all industry-sponsored. Well, one of them is being, uh, two of them are actually being run through cooperative groups. ANVIL is being run through the uh, US intergroup trial and NCI BR, BR31 is being run by, uh, by the Canadian uh, group, and uh, these employ either Nevo or Dervalumab, Empower 010, and Pearl are run by um, Genentech Roche and uh, Merck. And the first one out of the gate was Empower 010, and it's almost coming up on two years now since the results of Empower 010 was presented at ASCO, and this really is, uh, a, a breakthrough trial. Uh, I must say the results are completely surprising to me when they did come out. So they took patients with com a global trial, patients with completely resected stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer, uh, regardless of PDL1 expression. They had to have cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. So that was, and it couldn't be carboplatinum, it had to be cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, up to four cycles of that, and then randomization happened after you completed the chemotherapy, not necessarily all four cycles, but after the chemo. So if you did not get chemo for whatever reason, or if you get disease progression, you're out. And then you get randomized to a TESO every three weeks for a total of 16, uh, 16 doses? Yeah, 16 cycles of a TESO, so one year or best supportive care. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival, and it was tested hierarchically in the way that the statistician designed it is the first the, uh, the first uh, t target population is patients in who, uh, who have PDL1 expression, stage 2 to 3A, with PDL1 expression in 1% or more of the tumor cells. If it was positive in this group, then you test it in the second target population, which is DFS, 
in all patients with stage 2, 3A, regardless of PDL1 expression. And if it was positive after that, you did it in the uh, intention to treat population which included stage 1B. Overall survival was designated as a key secondary endpoint. So at ASCO, like I said, the, the, the results were presented. And here, just to show you the highlights of this, so it's a mainly uh, two-thirds were men, two-thirds had no non-squamous histology. PDL1 expression uh, was present in roughly a little bit over 50% of the patients. This was a, uh, a, a group of patients that had a significant proportion of patients with stage 3. About 50% had stage 2, and a little over 10% uh, of the patients had stage 1B. Uh, this is, again, reflected in the burden of nodal disease. Again, as you can see, N2 about a third, N1 about a third, and the rest are N0. And they had lobectomy uh, in the majority of cases. The other thing I will draw your attention to is that 83% of the patients, or 80% of the patients had mediastinal node dissection, and the rest had sampling. So these guys had the Cadillac treatment. Cisplatinum-based chemotherapy, a lobectomy, mediastinal node dissection, this is the best that you can get. That may not be necessarily reflective of many patients that we see in actual clinical practice, but it is a good place to start. So the primary endpoint, which is uh, disease-free survival in patients with stage 2 to 3A that express PDL1 in 1% or more of the tumor cells, there was a significant improvement in disease-free survival over best supportive care. At two years, it was 60, uh, uh, two years it was 74% versus 61%. The um, uh, hazard ratio was 0.66, which is equivalent to uh, a 34% reduction in the risk of uh, dying or recurrence. In all randomized patients with stage 3A, there was also a significant improvement in disease-free survival favoring the atezolizumab arm. The hazard ratio was 0.78, but as you can see here, it approaches unity. In the ITT population, which, which, which included the patients with stage 1B, uh, the follow-up was, n there appeared to be a benefit for a TESO, but uh, did not cross the statistical significance boundary, so these patients are still being followed for that particular endpoint. So this is uh, a, a, an unplanned post hoc exploratory analysis to see what the impact is on the various demographic and clinical variables on, uh, on, on, on DFS in the target population, again, stage 2 to 3A that expressed uh, PDL1 in more 1% or more of the tumor cells, as you can see across the age groups, gender, race, uh, both histologies really, but more so in the non squamous histologies. The greatest benefit was in patients with stage 3A and in patients with uh, uh, positive tumor burden. Uh, the numbers for EJFR and ALK were really small, precluding any meaningful uh, conclusions here, and, it's, and certainly the ADORA trial re renders that conversation really moot at this point. So one of the issues that arose is if DFS is positive, what, is, what are the data driven by? Uh, so it was mainly driven by the high PDL1 expressors. So this is the overall group of, P of the stage 2 to 3A uh, that expressed PDL1 in 1% or more. But as you can see, for those that expressed PDL1 in 1 to 49% of the patients, it is true that the hazard ratio was 0.87, but it did cross unity. And the main effect was really driven by those that expressed PDL1 in 50% or more of the tumor cells. When you look at the hazard ratio here, I think it was 0.43. And think about that for a second, because it means there's a 57% reduction in the risk of dying or recurrence from lung cancer in that group. That's an amazing thing to, uh, that you know, I personally have never seen. Now, this, the top line, includes all patients with ALK and EGFR mutations. So the thinking was maybe these were sort of uh, muddying the water here. But even when you take out the EGFR and the ALK population out of this, the data really doesn't change very much. And you can still see the DFS is primarily driven by the 50 percenters, although the primary, uh, the primary population for which the study was designed was this one here. So anything else would be an exploratory analysis. So in fact, the FDA in October, think about this for a second. So I think, I think the data was presented in June at ASCO. In October of the same year, the FDA approved the TESO 
for adjuvant treatment of following resection of uh, uh, and platinum-based chemotherapy in patients with stage 2 to 3A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on 1% or more of the tumor cells in these United States. Not so elsewhere. For, I think, in Canada, you guys, 50%? 50%, but uh, A16 was approved before the publication. Okay. Yeah. But 50%. But 50%. <laughs> yeah, but 50%. <laughs> yeah, no, in the adjuvant uh, setting. And, and, uh, and in most of the European Union, it's also, uh, well, not nearly 50%. all the European Union, it's approved for, for, for the 50 percenters. You know, I'm glad we're here. <laughs> it's, it's good to have an option for patients because really these patients have very few options once they've gotten the best treatment that they can get. And then the, the question always arises in your, on, your, on all your tumor boards is what happens with the patient who got carbotaxol or carbopam? And, and, and the answer is you get a teaser afterwards. Um, another issue that came up is what is the impact of some of the surgical procedures uh, on uh, whether or not you give immunotherapy. Remember immunotherapy, one of the big concerns that we have as surgeons is is that it, you, know, you can get uh, immune-related pneumonitis, and would it be appropriate to give it to somebody who had a pneumonectomy? And the, the, the argument goes, well, look here. You know, most of the benefit really is driven by the lobectomy group, and the pneumonectomy group, you know, the hazard ratio sort of crosses unity, the bilobectomy group the same. So the thinking went, well, if you had a pneumonectomy, you probably shouldn't get it. Now, number one is the trial wasn't designed to test that question, so that's sort of uh, opinion and not data. But uh, Jay Lee actually compared the groups in, in Empower 01, those that had pneumonectomy and those that did not, the lobectomy group. Uh, so here, here are his findings. So uh, again, similar in terms of male gender distribution, similar in terms of non-squamous histology in between the pneumonectomy group as a whole, 180 patients had pneumonectomy and the remainder had lobectomy. Similar in terms of the frequency of stage three and stage two disease, the adequacy of their mediastinal lymph node dissection and the proportion of patients with N2 disease. So a pretty good comparison even though it was not intended to be that way. They also, I'm one to say that you know, after pneumonectomy, patients are less likely to tolerate chemotherapy as well. Well, that did not prove to be true here. They got as much chemo cisplatinum exposure as the lobectomy group, but perhaps because they are the best of the best of patients. And uh, here, down here, you can see that the, number, the proportion of patients who were hospitalized during adjuvant chemotherapy was similar between those that had lobectomy and those that had pneumonectomy. So for all intents and purposes, there was no great difference uh, between the two groups in, before being randomized to a TESO. And these are the adverse events associated with uh, a TESO in blue, best supportive care in orange. This here is the pneumonectomy group, and this here the lobectomy group. And you can just look at this and say, you know, there's no difference really in the AEs that occur following either of those. And well, what about their ability to tolerate a TESO? So, Treatment was discontinued in roughly about a third of patients in each group. And why was it discontinued? Either through a, a adverse events, roughly the same, or disease relapse, roughly the same. The median treatment duration was 10 months. And this, remember, it was 16 cycles of a TESO, so they all get 16 cycles of a TESO. So that's pretty good. So I think, you know, uh, uh, Obviously, we ha one has to individualize in each particular case, but there is no really compelling data to suggest that you should avoid adjuvant immunotherapy in patients who had pneumonectomy. Well, we talked about uh, PDL1 expression as being a biomarker that drives the benefit from adjuvant immunotherapy. Another biomarker that we might consider that is not yet standard of care is ctDNA in these patients. And I must say that this trial did a really good job in collecting samples for ctDNA. 600 patients had their samples collected before and after. And as you can see here, the, the orange lines are the best supportive care. The blue lines are the ATEZO groups, okay? So clearly C, a, a positive CD, uh, ctDNA had negative prognostic implications. If you have positive ctDNA, you're going to do poorly. And you're going to do poorly regardless of whether or not you got a TESA or did not. But 
if you got a TESO with a positive cDNA, you did better than if you had a cTDNA positive and you got nothing. And the same is true if, you if you're cTDNA negative. So the benefit of adjuvant ATEZO in the, in, in the target population is um, uh, independent of positive cDNA. Now, as I told you earlier that the overall survival was a key uh, secondary endpoint, and uh, it, 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 an analysis was made, and this was presented in World Lung and again at ESMO, and you know, even though it seemed to favor the ATEZO arm, it did not seem to be significant at, uh, so far uh, at the current levels of follow-up with the hazard ratio sort of 0.71, but crossing unity over here. So the other trial really is a, is a confusing trial, and uh, a trial that was presented, I think, almost a year back and to the, to, until today has not yet been approved by the FDA, and I think it's probably best. Um, so this was the uh, PEMBRO. Remember, PEMBRO was like the golden boy of immunotherapy, Keytruda, you know, all over TV. Uh, same trial population, complete uh, R0 resection, and then get randomized, suggest you get chemotherapy, so no mandate for chemotherapy, and then you get randomized to PEMBRO versus placebo. So this had a co-primary endpoint. The first endpoint was disease-free survival in the overall population, regardless of PDL1 expression. And the secondary endpoint was disease-free survival in patients who had 50% or more PDL1 expression in their tumor cells. So I'm going to, you know, this is just to show you that even though chemotherapy was not mandated, the majority of patients did get chemotherapy. And this is the primary, the first primary endpoint, which is regardless of PDL1 expression, very significant improvement in survival. The hazard ratio was 0.76, and the p-value was 0.001. That is pretty darn good. Uh, the problem is the secondary endpoint, which was confusing because it flies against every bit of data about the impact of PD, high PDL1 expressors in lung cancer in advanced disease, in the ATESA tri uh, trial, and I suspect in many more. And that's not significant. Uh, I have no information about where this stands in terms of application to the FDA or what, do, do, you, do you know anything? No, I, I mean, all I know is um, Solange Peters attributes this to the overperformance of the placebo arm, but no, in terms of approval, it's... Um, well, placebo is pretty good. It, yeah, <laughs> surgery alone is pretty good. <laughs> Okay, so what, just for, uh, you know, uh, laughs and giggles, as they say, what are the differences between the two? Well, uh, really the distribution of stage three was much higher than uh, in, in the EMPOWER trial than in the um, uh, Keynote uh, trial. This had more stage two than, than the EMPOWER did. Both have had about roughly the same proportion of stage 1B. So it seems, although it's, it's hard to sort of compare trials, but it seems like Empower had w more advanced disease in it. Um, uh, the distribution of PDL1 expression was roughly the same between the two groups, but the main differences really are in the primary endpoints that were tested. So, and in conclusion, the use of immunotherapy in the perioperative management of resectable lung cancer is a major advance. There's no doubt about that. This is misspelled a little bit, so you know this goes back to uh, uh, whether or not you give uh, new adjuvant or adjuvant, and of course the refrain is we need more bio better biomarkers, as we always say at the end of every talk. <laughs> All right, fantastic. It, it's a lot of di data to digest. It's not going to get any simpler, uh, but I'll, I'll echo uh, Dr. Altorki's comments that it's really wonderful to have all these options for both patients who get preoperative or uh, postoperative ah, treatment. Was that supposed yes. to do this? Yeah, you're supposed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, adjuvant immunotherapy is current. Oh, this is the question from before. So I got to read it again. Adjuvant immunotherapy is currently FDA approved and indicated for which of the following patients' population with non small cell lung cancer following resection and platinum based chemotherapy? Patients with stage 2 to 3A whose tumors have PDL1 expression on more. 1% or more of the tumor cells. Shall I repeat that? <laughs> okay, patients with stage 1b to 3a whose tumors have PDL1 expression 
on 1% or more of the tumor cells, patients with stage 1b to 3a whose tumors have PDL1 expression on 50% or more of the tumor cells, and I am not sure. <laughs> yeah, this will be concerning if there's more number fours here. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Yes. Oh, look at that. All right. Effective. And, 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 and uh, look at Hany Shanib still in the I'm not sure category. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have um, a sort of a Q&A. Uh, we have a few cases to go through just to sort of illustrate some, some situ clinical scenarios, and then we'll be happy to take some questions. So the first case is a patient, Dr. Al Torquies. You want to walk us through yeah, this one? Yeah. So this is a, uh, a, a lady that I saw who I had done a lobectomy on on the opposite side. Uh, like, I don't know, like 10 years, make believe 10 years previously. And uh, she came back with uh, this big tumor in her left upper lobe. Uh, uh, she had a basilar segmentectomy, so almost a lobe. Biopsy proven 6.3 adenocarcinoma, T3 and 0 stage 2B. She did not have an EGFR mutation. Her PDL1 was 5%. Her FEV1 was 1.5. And we did a VQ that showed. Uh, uh, the left side had 45% of her perfusion. Oh. So what would you recommend for this patient? New adjuvant chemoradiation, definitive chemoradiation, new adjuvant chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, resection followed by adjuvant chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and I am not sure. That's not what we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Let's, uh, she had a left orchomy, left upper lobe. She had uh, solid predominant adenocarcinoma, PT4N1. She had adjuvant chemotherapy followed by adjuvant atezo. So I'm happy. This is a good point to have a discussion about this. Uh, my concern was that... Uh, She's an elderly woman, and uh, the tumor appeared quite central, and uh, perhaps a borderline resectability, and perhaps if she is not responding to the treatment, she might progress and preclude the probability of resection. That seems very fair. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious. Actually, I'll take advantage of this to take one of the questions from the, from the queue here. Um, the question is, in Empower 010, the patients included were post-operative stage 1B to 3A, most of them. Um, this, is, this is stage 3A as well, but the question is, what do you do with post-operative 3A, 3B, 3C, if you happen to find that? I don't, I don't know how. After resection? After resection. Are you recommending they should all get Well, just remember that, uh, that uh, the, the staging with Empower was in the old staging system, right? So, so say this was T4N2, which would be sort of beyond the... This one here? L let's say it was an N2. T4, N2, which it's even more advanced stage. Would you recommend they get adjuvant TESO in that case? Uh, it would be stage 3C, right? A, a correct, yeah. Yeah, so yes. Yeah. But according to the current I, I mean, indication, I the answer would be yes. W what, if, what if they had been to sort of a less uh, glorious surgeon and they had a positive margin? Would you, would you still recommend they get adjuvant TESO? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, you know that it is the, the 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 shrinking area of options here. Once yeah. you get to a tumor like that, I mean, what are you going to offer a 77-year-old who has a positive margin? I mean, I don't think radiation does a whole lot. In fact, it's probably not good for her. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think immunotherapy is a we're fairly well tolerated until it's not. Yeah, I agree. I think that's yeah. Wh yeah. why these trials are so important. Yeah. They've opened yeah. so many important options for their pa these patients. You know, I, I mean, I, uh, this, is n this is not sort of planned uh, d discussion here, but I have a patient, and we all have anecdotes, but, you know, you learn from your anecdotes sometimes. I have a patient who had T4 in one that we treated on the radiation I.O. trial, and I actually left disease on his left anterior descending. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got uh, focused radiation to the heart area, 
in uh, Ad Adjuvant and Durvalumab, and he is, the guy is five years out. That's a big deal. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, I think, I think that this whole thing with uh, immunotherapy, even though we don't understand everything behind it and how it works and so forth, I think is a real game changer, and, uh, you know, we should be open-minded about we that. We should keep yeah. Uh, yeah. the LEDs yeah. of uh, hopefully all of our patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, maybe uh, if people don't mind answering now, we've had this little discussion about this case. How have, has this discussion changed your mind? Would you now go to upfront surgery since most advocate for chemoimmunotherapy? Oh, do we have to read this? Oh, maybe. So, yeah, after listening to our discussion, what would you recommend for this patient now? Neoadjuvant chemo radiation, definitive chemo radiation, neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy, resection followed by adjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So you can. So, uh, so, so, uh, so I, I do think it's really important to. Uh, uh, and Jonathan may not like me after this, but uh, you know the the data in uh, in eight one six is primarily driven by the benefit, you might agree, in patients with stage three A. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, the sta patients with stage one B and two, especially if their PDL one is not that hot, you know tend to do maybe okay, maybe the same. And I think there is room for equipoise for patients with stage 1, B, and 2. And that's a trial that needs to be done that will never be done, which is to take those patients with 1, B, and 2 and randomize them to neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. And the only people that can do this trial is industry, and they want to move on from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we actually need to make those decisions on the patient. The patient comes in and has poor performance status, and before you know it, he gets four... I have a patient who got one cycle of chemotherapy and crashed and burned, yeah. and now he's uh, no longer fit for surgery. There's so, certainly yeah, difficult yeah, discussions yeah, for yeah, those yeah, patients, yeah, and yeah, individualization is yeah, going to yeah. be important. Here's another one of your patients. Uh, oh, yeah. what happened here? Okay. Okay, so this was a 76 year old man, former smoker, has this tumor. He uh, had a biopsy proven 9.8 centimeter squamous cell T4 N0 stage 3A, PDL1 was 60%. He had a bunch of stents, he was on Plavix, he had an implantable AICD, his FEV1 was 1.5, and the VQ is the same uh, as the previous case, although we did do another VQ in this one. Um, so I guess what would you do? Would you give this man new adjuvant chemoradiation, definitive chemoradiation, new adjuvant chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, or I'm not sure? No option for upfront surgery, eh? <laughs> I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, they, uh, the so what did you do? Clearly, these, uh, this crowd knows There's everything. They, they, they just came for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we gave him new adjuvant chemo IO, and he took it like a champ. I was really worried about him. And... Uh, he had uh, an MPR. To, I, I was shocked because uh, radiographically the tumor did not change, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 by PET the tumor did not change very much. You know the SUV went down a bit, yeah. but uh, it's it's always a good lesson. Uh, we learned that from the days of new adjuvant chemotherapy that you know radiographic response is not a correlate of pathologic response mm -hmm. so we found a 13.8 poorly differentiated squamous cell invading the chest wall with negative margin negative nodes would you give him adjuvant therapy jonathan um it w it was pdl1 I, I mean i 60 percent. yeah i think it'd be nice for, I, I think if i had to uh guess what the future will bring is that this patient will likely get adjuvant therapy. Um, I think it's going to be a patient-specific discussion in most cases. I'm curious because I probably would have given chemoimmunotherapy to the first patient. Does the centrality of the lesion matter for you? Is the fact that this is more peripheral, that you don't have higher issues in this? No, there's actually... Uh, the, did the, have if, you, uh, if you look, you know, the SVC was compressed and the tumor okay. sort of extended to the base of the neck and was compromising his subclavian vein. Is it, uh, who, who would give this guy adjuvant uh, immunotherapy in this setting? Just by, by the show, show of hands. hands. Is that two hands back there? <laughs> After the CV. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we need data on this situation. It's yeah. sort of a data-free zone. And yeah. um, 
and for sure, for us in Canada, we don't have option for it. Yeah. But here, it seems yeah. that it's nobody. Possible. Right. Well, one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's uh, not unreasonable. All right. So this is one of uh, my patients. Um, it's a complicated case. So she's uh, 75. She has a 20 pack year history, but quit many years ago. Uh, she comes with these bilateral lower lobe lesions. Uh, they're both sort of directed up more in the S6 region. She has really excellent lung function, ECOG zero. The SUV on the uh, right side is 11 for a 4.8 centimeter tumor and 19 for a 2.7 centimeter tumor on the left. We did a PET, we did EBA staging, the mediastinum is bone dry and uh, we had good cellularity with negative lymph nodes. So it's sort, sort of, uh, what seems to be bilateral early stage, stage one tumors. What would you do next? Would you book this patient for bilateral stage lower lobectomies in the absence of tissue for expediency? Uh, would you uh, suggest bilateral TTNAs for diagnosis or you're not sure? Okay, well, some people would take them to the OR, but most people are recommending TTNAs. I think that's reasonable. So th that's what we did, um, and we're lucky. Um, shockingly, uh, where I am, we, we do uh, reflex NGS for all of these needle biopsies, even if they are early stage, and we do, um, the information is, is useful. So uh, on the right lower lobe, it's a KRAS a G12F, a rare KRAS mutation, very unusual. And there's also an IDH2 mutation, not really sure the significance of that. And the PDL1 is 1%. That's the right sided 4.8 uh, centimeter tumor. On the left side, we have KRAS G12C with a PIC3 CA um, that's picked up and a PDL1 of 100%. So, just by probabilities, the likelihood that these are related tumors is exceedingly low. Um, so, it supplements the usual uh, histological classification, but they're, they're clearly two different tumors. So, we have a clinical T2BN0 on the right and a clinical T1CN0 on the left in a fit patient. Um, what do you do now? Who's doing still bilateral stage lobectomies, adjuvant therapy? Who would do a lobectomy on the right, SBRT on the left, adjuvant therapy? Uh, neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy, bilateral stage lobectomies. Neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy, bilateral stage surgery of some description that is a, a, a tailored to the response or you're not sure. While we're waiting, and Dr. Alturki, there's a question here. PDL1 EGFR Al KRAS testing indicated in every patient for PDL1 testing specifically are results useful in determining which patients to treat with new adjuvant chemo IO or for adjuvant only. So first of all, do you think all these patients should all have biomarker testing? I th you know, I, I, I I mean, I don't. I hesitate to say should. I, we get it. We get PDL1 on almost everyone, mm -hmm. and uh, we get EGFR on almost everyone, especially if we're going to give them new adjuvant IO. Okay. And uh, to what extent does the PDL1 influence your decision about preoperative treatment? <laughs> I think you have to individualize this. I think. Generally, I would feel more strongly about a PDL1 positive patient getting new adjuvant IO. I would have equipoise about somebody who's PDL1 negative and where I think their performance status is borderline. And mm -hmm. uh, if, if they have stage 1B or 2, I'm, if they have stage 3, there's no question that if they had stage 3, they would get chemo IO. Okay. Short of stage 3A, there is, I think, and we should all have some equipoise about that. And I see the answers there. They don't seem to have equipoise. They don't seem to have equipoise. <laughs> you guys need to have equipoise. This is stage 1B and 1A. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, yeah. well, I'm surprised. Yeah. I didn't think that's what people would put down. That yeah. This was her response. Well, you are a very persuasive man. <laughs> <laughs> so these, this was her yeah. pretreatment scan on the left and post-treatment. I cheat a little bit. The windows aren't exactly the same, but there was reduction in the size in both. The right lower lobe went from 4.8 to 3.7, and the left from 2.7 to 1.3. I don't know if this is the right thing. I had a very long, extensive discussion with the patient, but we did do bilateral staged S6 VAT segmentectomies. You know, I, I feel like that's uh, important for this patient. She had other GGOs elsewhere in the lung that might come up and be, need to be treated in the future. 
Um, but that, we had decent margins on this. But I, I do think that preoperative therapy created a scenario that... What, did she have PCR? So, so she had um, no pathological response on the right side of the tumor. It was 100% RBC. Case. <laughs> it doesn't mean she'll recur. She, she was no negative. And on the left, we're waiting for the path response. Okay. I don't have it yet. I don't. So, to be continued. Yeah. So, would more people do lobectomies here after having that little short discussion as we come to a close here? We're almost done. As you answer that, uh, one of the questions is about um, immune-related adverse events. So, say someone, pa some pa a patient gets grade three, four, immune-related adverse events on preoperative uh, immunotherapy, uh, let's say in your SBRT trial, for example, how would you manage those patients or, or with standard chemo immunotherapy? Well, what, what, you know, so what, what kind of immune-related adverse events? I think most people have some kind of, uh, you know, dermatitis or, uh, or uh, abnormalities in thyroid function. I've had a couple of patients who had uh, hyperamylosemia, which scared the hell out of me. Uh, and, uh, you know, a patient did not have clinical pancreatitis, thankfully. Another one had, like, uh, like a tr transaminitis with uh, transaminases in the thousands. It was not sick, but, you know, it's always, these things are always scary, and we're always reluctant to give them the second cycle of the IO yeah. and just proceed to surgery. Interestingly, those that have that kind of response usually have a very good pathological response in the tumor. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So very similar for us. Yeah. All right, well, look at that. More people going, okay, we'll see. F happy to chat with you guys uh, offline, but that pretty much brings our program to a close. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, have a great Congress. All right, thank you.